In the year 1998, one man by the name of Masahiro Onaguchi was on a quest to create an ambitious fighting game. Who? All you need to know for now is that he worked on games like Tekken and Soul Edge as a motion designer, but not just any kind of motion. 3D motion, ooh. I mean it was the 90s. Game consoles were focused on 3D as it was all the rage back then. Your favorite game series were entering this realm, and fighting games were no exception. So what do you get when you combine Genki, a game developer known for its racing games, and a guy who worked on these 3D fighters? You get... FIGHTERS DESTINY! Fighter's Destiny is a 3D fighting game that shines with its unique point scoring system, but it never really got much recognition due in large part to one thing. The game was only released on the Nintendo 64. While it had a rich library of games, the family friendly system didn't mesh all that well with the fighting game genre. The PlayStation had gems like Tekken 3 and Marvel vs. Capcom, but the N64's fighting game market was dominated by Super Smash Bros. And if you weren't a fan of platform fighters, your only choices at this point were Killer Instinct, one of the many mediocre 3D fighters, or Mortal Kombat Trilogy which was literally just a downgraded version of its PS1 counterpart, right down to the crunchy audio. Scorpion wins. What? I didn't play any wrong note. Yeah, see, you're playing it like this. Scorpion wins. When ordinarily it goes like this. Scorpion wins. But enough of the game's history. How was the actual game? Well, on the surface, it doesn't look that great. Even with the upscaled graphics that I'm using, Fighter's Destiny has an awfully amateurish look, especially compared to 3D fighters that predated. And you can tell that while the game is in motion, it comes off as sluggish and stiff in a lot of areas. As far as the characters go, they're as generic as they come. Just look at poster boy Ryuji. If Identity Death was a character, this would be it. Gameplay wise, he has an in your face aggressive playstyle, easily accessible as a quote unquote main character should be. Over on the right, we have Leon. With his pretty boy face and generic flaming gi, you can't tell me that this isn't supposed to be Ken Masters. And if you're still not convinced, why not check out his taunt? Come on! He acts as another well-balanced, straightforward character. Makes sense if you're going to be the Ken to Ryuji's Ryu. The rest of the characters follow the same generic standards as the first two, with some of the most creative names I have ever heard of such as Bob and Ninja. Thankfully, all of them do have their own quirks in battle, making for a variety of playstyles that makes it easy for a player to find a character that best suits them. The starting roster is small, but we also have 5 secret characters that stand out a bit more. I'm going to use this opportunity to mention the game modes at the same time as five of them each unlocks one of the five fighters. First up is Boro, unlocked through the game's arcade mode. In this you simply fight the nine starter characters with Boro as your last opponent. Not exactly final boss material, but you unlock a character with long and practical block strings. And when you select her, you get this wicked laugh. Next up is Robert, unlocked through the game's fastest mode. Here the objective is to fight and defeat four characters in under a minute. Doing so gives you the training dummy that's used for the game's training mode. Robert is undoubtedly the game's joke character. You know how 99% of characters in fighting games have a quick jab of sort in their arsenal? Well, here's Robert's. <laughs> Next up is Master, found in Master Challenge. This is where most of the single player effort went into. You have a roulette, and stopping this on any of Master's icons puts you in a fight with him. Each victory on Master gains you a new skill, but we'll talk about that part later. Defeating all 12 opponents in this mode gives you basically another Ryuji, but with more tools. I'm sensing a pattern here. Next up is a character that most of you who played this could easily remember. Ushi the cow. Yes, a cow. Unlocked through the game's rodeo mode by surviving in a battle with Ushi for over a minute. Maybe this was the inspiration for that one Kung Pao scene? Ushi uses an unorthodox fighting style with gimmicks and weird setups. Essentially a huge knowledge check. We're down to the final character, one who I feel made the biggest impact on all those who played the game. Joker is a force to be reckoned with. While the AI for the cast is relatively tame depending on the difficulty, Joker's AI is jacked. He's much harder to fight, and you'll find four of them in Master Challenge which would definitely be a thorn on your side. Unlocking the character himself is near impossible. To do so, you must defeat a hundred opponents in the game's survival mode, back to back to back, and one loss sends you all the way back to the beginning. It's so hard that this small tournament doesn't even have it unlocked, and I sure as heck couldn't do so. I had to cheat my way through. Joker's move list is more than double that of any other character, and he has all the tools to arguably be the best in the game. Although the game is largely unexplored, a tier list would definitely have Joker in this spot. In my opinion, he is the game's true boss. And voila, 
you have the full roster, not exactly oozing with charisma, but they are simple and easy to identify. Very important when it comes to the game's unique style of fighting. First up, the movement. Of course you have your left and right movement with very quick back and forward dashes. And like all 3D fighters, you have sidestepping as well. It's not really useful for dodging attacks, but more so for positioning yourself in the arena. Jumping is very brief, and interestingly enough, so is crouching. Both options immediately return you back to neutral. And I believe the reason for this is based on how attacks work in this game. Despite the many buttons of the N64 controller, there are only two attack buttons which closely resembles that of a virtual fighter, but unlike their punch and kick layout, Fighter's Destiny opts to use upper and lower attacks. The B button is relegated to attacks that target your upper body while the A button, as you might guess, targets your lower body. Therefore, your jump and crouch can be timed to avoid these type of attacks. But if you're not quite confident in your timing, you can always use the guard button. There's two types of guarding. This is high guard, this is low guard. Use them both to ensure that your defense is strong. And if you want even more layers to your defense, you can integrate the last button, otherwise known as Hirari. By simply holding the L button, this unique mechanic allows you to dodge both upper and lower attacks automatically. Now you might be thinking, why not just hold this button to go Ultra Instinct and never let your opponent hit you? Fortunately, the mechanic does have its drawbacks. First off, all your other buttons are locked until your L button is no longer held. Second, some attacks in the game are classified as mid attacks, and they completely nullify Harari. You can still crouch under mids, but it must be done manually. In the long run, you'll gain more by timing your dodges to put yourself in a more advantageous state. Harari isn't supposed to be a crutch for defense, but instead used for overcommitted strings that can leave a character wide open. The biggest weakness of Harari, however, is the existence of grabs. Grabs in this game are very weird. They have a startup of exactly one frame, and you cannot crouch to avoid them. On the upside, if you do get grabbed, this visual aid pops up which shows a lengthy tech window, and your position changes depending on how early you tech. You also have locks which are a different type of grab where the receiving end must match to end it, and the grabber could actually match mash back to slow down this process. Even the fastest mashing out will still guarantee some damage. Oh, and if you hold your L button while getting grabbed? You can't take it. What's the big deal? People take throws all the time in other fighters. Why should this be any different? Well... It's time we start talking about what really makes Fighter's Destiny shine. When you deplete a character of all their health, they don't get knocked out, but instead become dizzy. This state is officially named Piori. In this condition, your movement is limited, you cannot use any of your buttons, and you can't take throws. This makes you a very easy target. You are, however, able to manually dodge attacks, and your life bar automatically starts to recover. If you manage to avoid your opponent long enough, your health resets to slightly less than what you start out with. So it's not all doom and gloom if you have little health, but the life bar is simply a formality, as many of the game's finishers disregard how much health you may have. In most fighting games, primarily 1v1 types, you have rounds meaning that you're depleting multiple life bars. Fighter's Destiny is different in that you accumulate points with each round victory, and the way that you defeat your opponent is the deciding factor to how many points you get. There are 6 different ways to win a round. Starting from least amount of points given to most, you have Judge. When a match timer ends, generally the character who dealt the most damage is the victor, basically the game's version of a time over. Next is Ring Out. As you might have noticed, a lot of these arenas are just giant cubes like the kind you see when you open up blender. If one stands close to the edge, they're prone to being knocked out with an attack. Throwdown is when you successfully land a throw or deplete your opponent's life bar with a lot. Simple enough. Next up is knockdown. Some attacks are classified as knockdown moves and are identified by a blue glow. Landing one will give you the round, but these moves are pretty slow and can be dodged quite easily. They should ideally only be used as hard reads. Additionally, moves that normally don't knock down become so while an opponent is dizzy and if an attack has even the slightest bit of force behind them. If you if you hate mashers, you're gonna love counter. We've all had a time where you're plus on block, but they decide to mash anyway. Counter is achieved when you counter hit an opponent with these type of moves. If they connect with the active frames of another attack, it'll cause a bright flash indicating a successful counter. If you're on the receiving end, you're able to tech the counter by holding A and B to land on your feet with only a chunk of damage rather than a loss. Be careful with throwing these out as most of them are unsafe on block. Last but certainly not least is the special. When your opponent is dizzy, you gain access to incredibly flashy moves that give you a whole 4 points. Think of it as a finisher from Mortal Kombat. Finish him. <laughs> oh. 
and that is your point system. Instead of your usual best 2 out of 3 rounds, a single game of Fighter's Destiny can theoretically be anywhere from 2 to 13 rounds. By now, you can see just how insanely different the game is. Instead of autopiloting, you must take into consideration the many different ways that you can win or lose, and a single well-placed move could shift the momentum of a match entirely. I haven't even began to scratch the surface of how many complex mechanics and advanced techniques that the game has as you dig deeper. And covering every single little thing would make this video way longer than it should be. Just know that if you do decide to give the game a try, you'll have a lot to learn, such as the nature of a 3D fighter. That being said, the gameplay is not without its faults. This is more of a design flaw than anything, but if Danger. you sense that you'll be dizzy soon, why not just purposely fall out of the ring? Ring outs only give one point to your opponent, so you have up to 7 attempts by this method. But that's not as bad as the fact that you can actually cancel out of hitstun by holding guard. That means it's possible to make certain moves unsafe on hit that would be safe otherwise. Of course, this game came out in 1998, so I gotta give some leeway to the devs when it comes to polishing. Actually, I'm more curious as to why they thought the implementation of the gain skill was a good idea. Remember when I said that every time you defeat Master in Master Challenge, you earn a new skill? These skills are moves that get added to a character's move list. So if you want the full moveset of 10 of the characters, you must play through the single player aspects of the game. Imagine if in Tekken, Kazuya's Electric Wind God Fist was locked away until you earned it in a single player mode. That's how it must have felt playing through Master Challenge. Now, the idea of a person becoming stronger and learning new moves as they fight is pretty realistic and interesting, but that's a concept that should only be used for story mode purposes and not affecting the rest of the game. Fighter's Destiny is wildly different from its fellow fighters, but there is such a thing as being too different. The game never really expanded much as a series. The Japanese version released months later, and a sequel happened about a year later. But it was seen as a weaker game due in large part to more than half of the original roster either being cut or replaced by lamer characters. The gameplay was largely the same, and Master Challenge returned and is grindier to get gain skills with. If you want a proper sequel, I'd recommend Toy Fighter. Made for arcades, Toy Fighter shares a lot with with Fighter's Destiny thanks to being led by our already mentioned designer Masahiro Onaguchi. The game even fixed some of the gripes I had with the original such as this ring following the fighters, preventing intentional ring outs. If you can get past the strange premise, you'll see the loads of depth that the game has to offer just as its inspiration did. It's nice to see that the game's mechanics were given a second chance, and thankfully with the wide variety of options, you're able to practice them in various methods. If I had to describe Fighter's Destiny with one word, I'd call it experimental, whereas the presentation lacks originality. It makes up for this with its incredibly novel gameplay choices. In present day where fans show concern about rushdown playstyles dominating fighting games, and the fact that the more popular 3D fighters are either in limbo or shooting themselves in the foot, Fighter's Destiny ultimately became a right place wrong time situation. Fortunately, thanks to the game's great OST, quirky gameplay, and distinctive scoring, it managed to create a unique experience to those who played it, including me who played it during my childhood. For my final score, I give Fighter Destiny 7 out of 10 points. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, if you enjoyed these type of videos, please consider subscribing for more. And I also want to give a special shout out to I'm Amazon for his amazing guide on Fighter's Destiny. Couldn't have done this video without it. Thank you all, and I'll see you next time.